Sign of the Pagan is a small war game by Victory Point Games. It is available in the box edition in which so many Victory Point games have been available lately and the components of the game uh, look pretty nice. I would say even above average of boxed games by Victory Point Games. As for the topic, this is a game that depicts a battle that was fought in 1451 of the current era late Roman Empire and the two players in this battle were the remnants of the Western Roman Empire together with their allies against Attila the Hun and his allies. Um, small game, limited number of pieces, uh, uh, very simple rules, very straightforward, def definitely an entry, uh, way, an entry level uh, war game perfectly suitable for people that never played war games. Not much secret information. The secret information that you have is really limited, so the game is still playable solitaire. You can play both sides at the best of your uh, possibilities. Designer is Richard Berg. I don't know if you can see the name. Oh, it's, it's really small. Well, trust me, Richard Berg. And uh, you can see the similarity between this game and other games uh, designed by him, such as Infidel and Men of Iron. I would say especially Infidel, because in this game, uh, cavalry, uh, light cavalry with range capabilities uh, is, is a big element of the game, like you had in Infidel. Um, it, it mirrors the tactics of some of the forces involved in the battle of riding close to the opponent, showering the opponent with arrows and then moving away. So if you enjoyed that in Infidel, this is definitely an element in the game. Let me show you how the game plays, uh, how the game looks and works, but before that I have a question. Am I the only one who thinks that Attila kind of looks like Daryl from The Walking Dead? This is the board of the game representing the area where the battle will take place. The board is actually made of two separate boards that you place one adjacent to the other. They are made of cardboard. They lay flat quite easily. You can always use a piece of plexiglass if you need to. Here you see the setup of the game with the Roman units aligned here and ready to fight in that direction, Romans and their allies. And on this side you have the Huns and their allies ready to fight in this direction. Most of the terrain as you can see is clear. There are some terrain features here on the two sides but they are not likely to affect the battle in a major way. Units are represented by these counters here which are pleasantly thick as you can see here they are dirty uh, with suit when you first punch them so you will have to clean the edges on the plus side then after that you have counters that are really nice looking and pleasant to manipulate and look they're clipped already hooray units are divided in groups identified by colors for example here you can see the romans the alans and the visigoths each group comes with a set of activation markers such as such as this set this is for the roman player at the beginning of each turn each player chooses five activation counters that a player has a similar set you can choose multiple copies of the same counter that means that then when you use activation markers to activate your units a group will be able to activate multiple times in a turn so the opponent knows you're choosing five but doesn't know which ones you're choosing okay suppose that this these are the ones that i want to choose like this these ones after you choose the ones the five that you want to use in the present turn you choose one that you're trying to activate at the beginning of the turn players roll a die they add the modifier based on the group that they're trying to activate and the player with the highest total gets to activate that counter then the remaining nine counters uh, the remaining nine activation markers for for that player and five for the other are placed in a <clears throat> in a cup in another opaque container of that sort and then <clears throat> you will uh, activate uh, formations by well at the beginning you activate the one that uh, 
was selected by the die roll and then you draw uh, activation markers from the cup and the one indicated by the activation marker is the formation that gets to activate. Another element in the game before we start talking about the main mechanics is cards. Each player has a set of cards, some of which have no effect. They have uh, right, the effect of making the good cards a little harder to come by. At the beginning of the game you shuffle your cards together you draw four, those go in your hand, the fours that have not been selected, that do not go in your hand, cannot be used this game, and then you will simply use the card uh, whenever the effect described on the card applies, and you will be able to benefit from the advantage described on the card. So you selected your activation markers, you draw one of yours right now, hooray, now you get to activate the units that belong to that group. Now units have two ratings, one is combat points and the other one is movement points. Uh, the color in the background of the combat value uh, may indicate various things, for example if that color is red then that unit has ferocity. There are other units with different background and that indicates different things. You have some cavalry units, you have infantry units, you have both a letter indication for that and of course the illustration also helps you. Some units have uh, range attacks and those are indicated by the symbol of the bow printed on the counter. There are two different types of bow, the simple bow and the compound the compounded bow and they work in slightly different ways they have different values when you're activating units of your activated group then you can move with them and simply move by spending movement points units have an orientation um, the units always must be facing one of the corners of the X in which they are as you're moving you don't have to worry about orientation but once um, uh, you are you stop moving then you have to choose the orientation that your counter will take. Also you have to stop moving when you move adjacent to an enemy combat unit. Also it's important to remember that units have uh, <coughs> three sides to them. The two frontal axes are, well, the two, the frontal axes, the axes right before the counter. Then uh, units have two flank axes on the side and two rear axes behind. When you move in the frontal axis of a unit that has a range attack, the unit can reaction fire, so you have to be the target of that attack. Other things, when you're adjacent to a unit you can move away, but it is possible uh, that you are engaged with a unit. You become engaged by attacking a unit in return and then still being adjacent to that unit the following turn. Then, then use a marker to indicate that you're engaged with the enemy units and moving away from a unit when you're engaged means that you spend two extra movement points and that the moving unit is disordered. Units have two states, one is regular, the other one is disordered. If you're in, when you're disordered you have lower values, those are indicated on the counter. There are also other negative effects. When you're disordered, if you take a second disorder, it um, can be bad because then you need to roll a die. Uh, you may have modifiers that apply and if the total modifier roll is 4 or less, uh, the unit is safe, otherwise the unit is eliminated. And in this game we use a d10. I think that that's kind of important to know when we're talking about die rolls. When you move, so as I said, you may uh, you may have to interact with enemy units if you move adjacent to them. You may also fire against the opponent if the moving unit has range attacks and if the moving unit is cavalry or light infantry, you can fire at any time during movement. You can move a bit, fire and then keep moving, but firing costs a movement point. If you have an heavy uh, infantry unit that has a range attack you can move and then you fire you have to fire only you can fire only at the end of your movement to resolve fire you simply look at the stable roll a die 
apply possible modifiers uh, cross-reference with the type of unit that is firing and you simply see the result which may be no effect or a disorder level uh, applied to the target unit so you move you may fire and after all of your units that you wanted to move and or fire with have moved you can shock attack uh, enemy units that are in the front uh, in the front sides of your units. When you are resolving a combat of that type, when you are resolving shock combat, both player roll a die. So you roll a die for each unit involved in the combat and you apply possible modifiers. If the modified die roll is equal to or less than the unit's shock attacker rating, that would be that one, the combat results, then the opponent is, is disordered. So it can be pretty um, pretty brutal and it is good if you're able to maneuver in such a way that you obtain modifiers that are uh, beneficial to you. For example, attacking through flank or through the rear of the opponent, of course that's good. Terrain effects may apply. Momentum attacks, which you indicate by placing this marker here, uh, you get that benefit if you move adjacent to an enemy in the same activation in which you're attacking so you're just using the momentum of the movement to make your attack more powerful a ferocious attacker that is an attacker with ferocity uh, the red combat value attacker with ferocity gets an extra minus one when attacking with momentum so a momentum attack with a ferocious attacker uh, gives you a total of minus two all modifiers are cumulative also, there are results that may lend to continued attacks and those give you a penalty of plus one. Because again, you're trying to roll under or equal to your, your shock attack. Another thing that your unit can do is that if you have a unit that is disordered, is being activated, the unit is not adjacent to enemy units, then you can spend the interactivation to try to reform, in which case you simply roll a die, and then based on the result, the, uh, the disordered counter may be reformed, so you flip it back to the um, normal side, may remain disordered, or maybe they messed up so badly that they are eliminated. Speaking of die rolls that really matter, the Alans, uh, yeah, we were, they were fighting uh, with the Visigoths and the Romans, but they're pretty shaky, pretty unreliable. Each time that you activate them, you roll a die, and if you roll a zero, they defect. That is, you simply remove the Alan units from the map, wherever they are and whatever it is that they are doing. Also, their morale is prone to get pretty low if one of them is eliminated. If one Alan unit is eliminated, then you have to roll a die and on a roll of six or more, they all defect. The game is very uh, playable. Uh, definitely, I enjoy the uh, chat pull mechanics. People who watch my videos know that I am very partial to this mechanic. Um, the way you have it here is not the way it is implemented in many games in which you throw all of the chits in there or the number and type of chits that you put in the cup follows a certain schedule. Uh, there is a secret selection of those chits that is involved, uh, which on one hand it feels like it may limit the, uh, the uh, solitaire playability of the game, uh, on the other hand, it really doesn't have that big of an effect. Uh, a game that uses similar mechanics and that people still play solitaire, that includes me, is A Victory Denied. Th this game does that on a um, smaller scale. So you still uh, select the forces that you would like to activate. You place the chits in the cup, even if you're playing the game solitaire, and that's it. I guess that if you really want complete um, blindness as to the future, as to the forces that may activate. You can just put all of the uh, activation chits of both sides in the cup and then you simply draw until you drew five per and, and that's it. Then you really have no idea what's going to happen next. I wonder if that will uh, bring too much randomness to the game. I haven't tried it that way, but I guess that's an option that you can experiment with uh, to have complete fog of war. The cards, yes, uh, that's another element that if you're playing solitaire um, will give you more information than you would have if you were playing the game uh, against another player. But 
not too much of a big deal. The pace of the game is pretty good, the number of forces involved is, is small, the number of units that you activate in each unit, in each uh, with the activation marker, well, can change depending on the size of the forces that, that are activated by that marker, but still it is not such that the opponent will have to sit for 20 minutes to wait for you to complete your move, unless you're really slow and then maybe you shouldn't be playing this game at all. Uh, the mechanics work well. <coughs> I can see how some of the ideas that Berg has used in other designs about the Middle Ages uh, are have been transferred here. Uh, the activation system is different from Infidel, for example, but there's a general feel, a general flavor that I found that reminded me of that other game, and since I liked Infidel and I liked the mechanics behind uh, that game, I really uh, was happy to see those things, those ideas here. At the same time, this is not a clone, this is not a new scenario in that system. Uh, it is pretty much a game that has its own identity. I, I have the sense that actually this feels like it could be the beginning of a new system. And I am reinforced in that opinion by uh, the scope and size of the game. Um, the reason minus to this set is that it only contains one battle, uh, we've seen that, uh, with some repl extra replay value given by the free setup, but in general, the battle can't really play out in too many uh, different ways. Even mm, in scenarios of games like Infidel, sometimes you have a pretty lengthy uh, number of optional rules that you can include that can change the overall feel and pace and the narrative of the of the battle. Not so much here. In a sense, uh, in a sense, I'm almost surprised that this game was released as a single. As a single installment, it feels like this is a battle scenario that can easily belong to a larger game. Like you could have maybe a sign of the pagan set, pagan set with four, five, six battles, like you have in other games such as Infidel or Blood and Roses or Man of Iron. Uh, it's a pretty limited scope, so I like the game and I wonder if this is somewhat a marketing experience. Maybe they got this game here with a single scenario as, as a trial to see how people respond and then if the response is positive there will be a larger set with more battles coming out. If that is the case, my response is positive uh, because I like this game, I like this scenario. I like how the battle plays out, I like the mechanics, I like the intersection between the mechanics and the theme. I think they, they work well together and they give you an overall nice playable experience. An experience that is not hugely replayable, the staying power of the game is probably not much. After I played it a bit I felt like, oh I'd like to see more battles in this game and then maybe after playing more battles I will come back to this one. But that was impossible because because that battle is the only one that you find in the set. So Sign of the Pagan, yes, I enjoyed it. Um, I wish there were more battles in uh, in the system, and maybe there will be more in the future coming out. If that is the case, I just hope that they don't come out a battle per game, but they come out as a multiple set, as a set with multiple battles in it. Sign of the Pagan by Richard Berg, by Victory Point Games. A good game in its own right, hopefully the beginning of something bigger than itself.